So uh, I just want to let you guys know, uh, I'm not typically a public speaker, so I'm a little terrified of this. Uh, all week I've been thinking this is going to be miserable for me to do. But then last night uh, at high school youth group, I was on a panel that taught relationship advice to a group of high school boys. And uh, I'm just going to, I'll let you know now, they're way more terrifying than you guys are. It was scary trying to give them advice. But so yeah, Levi, uh, wherever he went, thanks for the, the great intro. You guys know me. I'm RJ Parks. I'm a deacon here at First Family, uh, also uh, the director of operations. And uh, tonight I'm going to have the privilege of sharing with you guys, uh, you know, through our, our message in First Timothy. I've got chapter three, so we'll get dive into that in here in a minute. But uh, first, I want to just share a quick story about myself, all right? So, um, you know, being a guy, I really don't like reading directions. So when I get something new, I typically think, you know, I can put it together by just looking at the picture of what the finished product is. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty handy guy. If you've seen my garage, I've got all the tools you'd need to do most jobs. Uh, so why would I need directions, right? So typically, in my house, uh, this process goes like this. My wife's back there in the back. She can, she can uh, say this is exactly how it goes, because this is a story that actually happened in our house. Um, so I'll tell my wife, I'll say, Katie, I, you know, I really could use a, a new bedside table. And she'll agree. And so obviously, you know, we, we want to find a good deal. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll drive to the nearest Ikea, and we'll get probably the cheapest furniture known to mankind. And we'll load it up, and we'll drive back home. And uh, once we get home after a long drive, I've got to put that thing together, right? Well, like I said, I don't like reading directions. So usually I, I, I lack the patience to do this correctly. So Katie will start out. She's always helping me. She'll start out by unboxing the, the furniture. She'll lay all the pieces out so we know we have exactly all the parts and everything, right? But that's when I get involved. So she'll be reading the directions, and she'll be talking about part A goes to part B, and this is the screw you use. Meanwhile, I've looked at this picture, and I'm like, no, part E goes with part Z, and you don't even need screws, right? And uh, so I skip ahead. Well, of course, this leads to frustration from my wife, and obviously from me as well, because it never goes to plan. So, um, you know, I'll listen eventually. I relent, and I'll listen to my wife as she goes through the directions. And what happens is we end up putting it together correctly, and we get a great piece of furniture. Now, if, if Katie wasn't there for me, I would be uh, left with probably just a pile of wood and some screws, right, and no table. But that doesn't work that way. So it always works the right way. So you're going to see, at times, I need someone to help me, you know, to help lead me, and I want that person to have the instructions, right? So that is the point of 1 Timothy 3 tonight. We need people to lead us as a church. Those people, those, those people are elders and deacons. What we're going to learn tonight is what makes an elder and deacon and how do they get qualified. So uh, before we jump into the passages, let's just do a quick refresher on why Paul sent this letter to Timothy. Uh, you'll see the church at Ephesus had fallen on some really bad times, both in theology and behavior, and changes needed to be made. So in these verses, what we're going to see is Leadership needed to be replaced, and qualifications for new leaders had to be established. So let's jump in and see what, quali what those qualifications are. So I'm going to have the, the passage is going to be on the screen behind me. Uh, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to read through it once the first time, and then we're going to go through it a little kind of verse by verse, all right? So, uh, Daniel, if you want to put that up there. We'll start it. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer... He desires a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders, so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. Verse 8 moves to deacons. It says, Deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, 
not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. They must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Wives, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not slanderers, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Deacons are to be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their own households competently. For those who have served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed in the world, and taken up in glory. So as I was preparing for this message, you know, I'd listened to multiple uh, pastors give uh, their take on 1 Timothy 3, uh, read a lot of different commentaries. Uh, what I noticed was most of the pastors uh, took this chapter, and it's 14 verses, and they broke it into five to nine week uh, sermon series, right? So I'm not, I don't have that luxury tonight. Uh, Brennan said I have two hours, so um, I'm going to take all of them. So Lauren, settle in, okay? All right, let's, uh, uh-oh, I lost something on my iPad. All right, this is the first time I've used an iPad to do this too, so if I screw it up, we'll just blame that. All right, so let's start right away. Let's look at the qualifications, okay? Uh, so very fir first one, verse one, I want you guys to notice. Um, you're going to see a bunch of things in these qualifications. They really lead to four different things in a person's life, okay? Um, they lead to character, home life, maturity, and reputation. All right, these are all important because these are what God is telling us that are the musts that a church leader must have in their life, right? So if you want to be an elder or a deacon in the church, you must have a high moral character. You must have a good home life. You must show maturity at all times. And you must have a good reputation with others. So right from the start, the very first uh, line in that is, this saying is trustworthy, right? Trustworthy is a pretty good word. Simply put, they're saying, this is the truth, okay? This is the truth. Everyone knows it. Right after that, it says, if anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble work. So I want you guys to underline the words aspires and desires. Okay, so as we look at that first line, there's several things to notice here right off the bat. One, you're probably asking yourself, what is an overseer? At First Family, we use the word elder. Is it the same thing? Yes, the word could also be, uh, some translations will say bishop, some will say pastor. Uh, we use elder, right, when we talk about the overseer. So they're all the same person. A bishop is someone who is spiritually mature. A pastor is someone who feeds you. An overseer has the responsibility of oversight. So at First Family Church, that's all one role. We call it an elder. You're going to see, uh, you'll see our elders doing that on a weekly basis as they care for all of us uh, in a spiritual manner. So the second thing to pay attention to, and you saw the list of qualifications a lot of people don't think this is your first qualification, but my opinion is that the first qualification jumps right at you right away. And it's the two words that I had you underline, aspire and desire. You see, the elder must, be, must feel a calling from the Lord to pursue this honor. So many people think I should be an elder, right? Because they lead many people in their line of work. They have made a name for themselves in the business world. They do well with money, they have a big house, drive a really fancy sports car, you know, whatever, you get it, they're successful people. Why wouldn't they be elders in the church, right? What you're going to see is that none of that matters to God when it comes to leading his church. So some aspire to be a church leader because of the power that comes with it. Uh, believe it or not, there's people that believe that with it becoming an elder or a church leader, there's some sort of power that they get from that. It's the type of power where they can shape the direction of the church. They can decide where the money goes. They can start to get their way and what they want. 
They'll even change what the pastor preaches or how he preaches on a Sunday. And you know what? A lot of them think that once I become a leader in the church, I'm going to tell Taylor and Levi that the songs they're singing need to change. And I'll get my way because I'm an elder, right? Well, what you'll see here is the qualifications that a leader must have eliminates those thoughts. It eliminates those type of people from serving. So what does it look like to aspire the position of overseer? Simply put, you will have a passion of the heart for this position. You won't want to do anything else. So I'm an example of this. I get asked sometimes why I'm not an elder. Like I said before, I'm a deacon at this church. So here's my, my short answer. I have a passion to be a deacon. 16 years ago, the Lord called me to be a deacon. He lit a fire in my heart to serve. And that fire still burns today. So for me, I don't have any aspirations to move to the office of elder. I still want to be a deacon. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's what the Lord's put on my heart, right? So that passion that you get from the Lord is not something that you can take a personality test and have it tell you that you've got the passion to be an elder or a deacon or because you see a way to financial or societal gains. I'll have you guys flip over to 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3, where it tells you exactly uh, that. Uh, I'll just read it for you now. It says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to re be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you. Here it is. Not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not out of greed for money, but eagerly. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So really, when you have that passion, here's what you're going to do. You're going to seek only to serve the Lord. When you do that, that's when you truly have passion to serve as an elder or deacon in a church. Lastly, in that passage, it, it speaks of the role being a noble work. Okay? Obviously, a noble work, that means it's something great and important. You could say that God sees this work as needed and necessary. All right, now we're going to speed up a little and go through the, the list a little faster, all right? Uh, the next qualification in there is to be above reproach. A lot of people will say, what does that mean? Here's one word for it. It means blameless, okay? It means that uh, you should be uh, copyable. It should, means you're the example, so follow me, right? Or in other words, follow me as I follow Christ, so I want you guys to get a mental picture of this. I'm not sure if the video will play, Levi. I can't see. There's too many lights on me. Yes, the video will play. Hold on. Don't play it yet. Um, so first of all, here's the mental picture. Uh, imagine a boxer. Imagine this boxer's name is Muhammad Ali. Hopefully some of you have heard of him. He's the greatest boxer of all time. Uh, imagine he gets backed into a corner by another fighter, and the fighter's punching him as many times as he can, in fact, like 21 times in a matter of seconds, but none of the punches actually hit Muhammad Ali, okay? Uh, he ducks and dodges every single one of them. Uh, you play the video now, Levi. If you guys look, if you slowed it down and counted, you'd see the punches, you'd see how he's just moving. Uh, it's a famous, a famous clip called, called Rope-A-Dope, okay? Uh, so basically, it was George Foreman fighting as hard as he could and trying to hit Ali, but he couldn't do it. All right. So this can be say this. This could also be said for the church leaders. All right. Uh, to be above reproach means nothing's going to touch you. Okay. And it's because of the way you live your life. So think of the church people, and they're gonna they're gonna hurl accusations at church leaders because that's what we do. That's what people do. Right. We wish they wouldn't, but it happens. The way the elder lives their life, those accusations can't touch them, much like Muhammad Ali. Okay? So a lot of people will say to be above reproach is the umbrella that all of the rest of the qualifications will fall under. If you, can, if you can unfold that umbrella, you've got the rest of them covered, okay? Uh, going down the list, the next one is a husband of one wife. Uh, basically, it's translated to mean uh, you're a one-woman man. You're devoted to one woman. Uh, you don't lust after another. You don't uh, have extramarital affairs. You don't do those things. You're a one-woman man. 
Uh, that does speak to present times. So uh, there are some people out there that say, well, this means then that if, if you were ever divorced, you can't be a church leader. That's, that's not what the Bible's saying. This is in present times. You have one wife. You're a husband of one wife, okay? So don't, don't get that mixed up. Uh, the next one is self-controlled, and some of these are really ones that are, are very easy to understand, uh, but I'll give you a quick little uh, one-sentence definition of each of them as well. Uh, self-controlled means you're clear-headed. Uh, you know how to hold your tongue. Next one is sensible. You're well-disciplined. Uh, your life is in order, not in chaos. I'm sure many of you uh, know people that uh, uh, their lives are constantly in chaos. There's always something crazy going on in their lives, right? You won't see that with the elders. You'll see seasons where elders and deacons uh, might have some chaos in their life that they just, you know, they're working through, but their life is, in a con is never a constant chaos. They've got things in order, okay? Uh, respectable, you're highly regarded by others, right? Uh, the next one's hospitable. Now, this one, a lot of people think, oh, I know what hospitable means. It means uh, I throw a mean party, right? This Sunday, I got the Super Bowl coming up, and, and I'm going to have a bunch of people in my house, and I'm going to be really nice to them and feed them pizza and uh, probably invite RJ over. He doesn't have any plans, but you guys can do that if you want, Lauren. Just kidding. But anyways, uh, that's not what we're referring to here. What we're referring to is um, strangers and how do you love strangers. So our elders and our deacons are called to love on strangers. Uh, we must be able to invite strangers into our lives, okay, and not, not have a second thought about that. That's what hospitable means there in that translation. Uh, elders have to be able to teach, the overseer, able to teach. And you'll see that uh, played out here at First Family with uh, all the elders uh, that teach on stage, uh, especially uh, Pastor Todd and Pastor Travis. They're our main teachers at this church. The next one is not an excessive drinker. Okay, does this, this does not mean you can't ever drink alcohol. Okay, back in those times, they did drink alcohol, right? We know that. Uh, what it means is you're not known to drink excessively, and you're not known as a drunk. Okay, so I think when I hear that one, I always think about uh, the sitcom from the 80s, uh, Cheers. I don't know how many of you guys, and I know none of you are probably old enough to see it, but maybe you watch it in the reruns. Uh, there's, a, there's a character on there. His name's Norm Peterson. Uh, every time he walks into the bar, no matter what time of day it is, he walks in and the entire bar yells, Norm, because he's in there so often they know him. Okay? If we're talking about an overseer or a deacon, they're not known in a bar. Okay? That's not where they would frequent. Next one is not a bully, but gentle. Basically, that means you're going to get upset, right? Things are going to upset you. When that happens, don't get physical. Don't punch the person in the face because they, they made you mad, right? You got to be able to control yourself. Next one's not quarrelsome, which again, don't fight. Have a short memory when it comes to things like that. After that, we've got not greedy. So you can't be a lover of money. After that, it's a couple that, that are explained really well just in the text. Uh, he must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. That would mean he's a strong spiritual leader. So if anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? So for us to do that, we have to inspect their home life. How do they care for their loved ones? When you see that person, when you see that man, do they do every, are they first for everything, or do they put everyone else first and they're last? That's what we look at. After that, he must not, not be a new convert. Again, it explains it in there. He might become conceited and full of pride. Okay? Now, the time frame on what it means to be a new convert, it's not laid out in the Bible, right? That speaks to maturity. Okay? So there are going to be some people that have been, you know, they accepted Christ, and a couple years later, they want to pursue eldership. Great. If they show the maturity and they show the other aspects of the qualifications in their life, they have, the, they have the right to serve or the option to serve, right? But if they're not showing that, when they go through the testing period, that'll be fleshed out and they'll be asked to wait a little bit longer. And then lastly, he must have a good reputation among outsiders, uh, and that is so he does not fall into disgrace or the devil's traps. Okay, so that wraps up the qualifications for the leadership level in the church. That's the elders or the pastors. 
So these are men that are setting the vision of the church and making the decisions that get the church to that vision. So after that, the next level of service is in leadership is the deacons. So notice how similar they are to the elder. And I'll just read through these real quick without any definitions so you guys can, because we've already talked about all of them. So worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, they're husbands of one wife, and they manage their children and households well. So in here, I want you guys to look at verse 10, and I want you to underline the word also. Actually, circle the word also, where it says, they must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. So I talked about the testing process for the elders. If you go back and look at the elders' qualifications, there's no testing process that's laid out for them, right? But in this verse, uh, he, he uses also meaning back to the elders and also the deacons have to be tested, right? If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. So Paul was talking about the elders and transitions to the deacons. The word also here is going to tie the two of them together, meaning both the elder and deacon are to be tested before they serve. So if, at FFC, here's how we do that. We test our leadership in a variety of ways. So first for the elders, they'll go through an interview process here with the entire elder group. And then after that, they meet one-on-one -on -one with all the current elders. And then they'll go through a book on plurality. The deacons will also be asked to interview with the elders. And what they do, instead of the one-on-one -on -one interview, is they'll shadow a current deacon in a serving opportunity. So in both cases, the candidate will be placed before the congregation for a three-week inspection process. During this time, the congregation can speak to any of our current elders about any sin issue that could disqualify a candidate. So you might have noticed over the last three weeks, uh, we're currently in one of these inspection periods as we have two new elder candidates, Scott Searsan and Brett Stiles. And you'll hear more about them on Sunday because I believe they've passed their inspection process and they're going to start serving as elders. All right, moving on to verse 11. Uh, so now we're introduced to something that, um, a new word here, and the word is wives. So as I was doing this study, and I've, I've taught this before uh, in deacon classes, in church leadership classes, and uh, this is what I, I find amazing about Scripture, is something new can jump out at you no matter how much you think you know the passage, right? So I've always just kind of just glossed over this part, you know, the wives. It must mean the deacon's wives, right? But if you notice in that, in that verse, it doesn't have the word there at all. So it doesn't say their wives. He's talking about deacons, and then he transitions to wives, okay? So there's a couple different things as I was looking through uh, commentary on this. What could that mean? So looking back, the original word uh, is translated from the word uh, woman. So we're left to wonder who is Paul re referring to, right? And he doesn't give us the answer in Scripture. So we're kinda, we kind of have to wonder. We kind of have to you know, decide what we believe. So I'm going to give you guys my opinion, but I'm also going to encourage you to dig into this a little bit and, and decide what you guys think it is. So really, there's about four options that I've come up with. Um, some commentators would say it's the deacon's wives. Some would say it is both the elders and deacon's wives, because, you know, why would they, why would the, why would Paul write about uh, the deacon's wives only and not mention the elders' wives when the elders were the first ones listed and the, the, the role of overseer is a bit more important? Um, some say it means women deacons. And some would say it's, it refers to all the women of the church, okay? So I probably lean to it being the wives of the elders and the deacons, and here's why. Um, we know he's addressing a third group by the use of the word likewise. He also used likewise when transitioning from elders to deacons. And I don't think he'd be addressing the deacons' wives without mentioning the elders' wives. Women deacons are a possibility, and probably a pretty strong possibility, to be honest, uh, but I wonder why he would move back in verse 12 to the deacon title again. So if you guys see on 8, he's talking about deacons. He goes to 10, he's talking about wives, and he transitions back to deacons again after that. And then also in verse 8 and 11, the first qualification is worthy of respect. So he says that both for the deacons and then for the wives as well. So 
if it is women deacons, I, I probably wonder why he's repeating himself, right? Um, you would think they would certainly have the same qualifications as a male deacon, and they wouldn't have to be, it wouldn't have to be stated that way. But ultimately, there's good points that can, could be made for both sides. So when I say I lean one way, I probably am as close to being on the fence as you can. I'm probably like a 52-48, believing it's, it's women, uh, it's the wives of the elders and the deacons. But again, like I said, I encourage you guys to dive in, decide for yourself. But either way, whichever way you choose, I can tell you for certain that these women are also held to a high standard. If you look at their qualifications, they are worthy of respect, not slanderers, self-controlled, and faithful in everything. So as you can see, the spiritual qualifications between a deacon and an elder are very similar, right? Uh, but there must be a difference. Why else would they indicate two roles? The difference is in function, not in spirituality. And the one function that sets them apart is that an elder has the ability to teach. Now, I want you guys to, I want to be clear. That's not to say that deacons cannot teach. Obviously, I'm trying to do that right now, right? Um, and all of our deacons have a role either currently or in, in the past year or two where they've been small group leaders uh, here at First Family. So all of our deacons have the ability to teach, but they're not the guys that are going to be up here teaching the entire church on a Sunday morning. Though that is reserved for the elders. So one way I look at this to define these two roles is uh, both of them are leaders in our church, but they lead in different ways. So the elders serve by leading, and the deacons lead by serving. So that's something you've probably heard Pastor Todd as he's talked through church leadership. That's how he uses, uh, that's a, a clear way for him to distinguish the difference between the two. So the role of the elder, though, I want you guys to know is a weighty one. Uh, most of you have no idea what they do on a daily basis to serve our church. Uh, at FFC, they pray for our people, they counsel our people, they grieve with our people, they teach our people, and they watch over our spiritual lives. They meet on a weekly basis every Tuesday morning, and they study scripture together. And then they pray for all of us on a weekly basis. I'm telling you, it can be really fascinating to sit in the room with them and watch the wisdom and humility they operate with. You get to see the qualifications that the Bible has just listed out here. You get to see that played out in each one of the men that we have chosen as elders here in this church. Now, our deacons, they also do some things. They assist our elders uh, by taking the day-to-day -day physical tasks off their plates so they can operate with a laser-sharp focus on the task of caring for our congregation spiritually. The areas that our deacons, I'm sorry, the areas our deacons focus on are leading our finance team, they lead our safety team, they care for our widows, they manage benevolence needs, and many other things. So just tell you a quick, you know, story about how I became a deacon. So six, I said 16 years ago, I was called to be a deacon. Here's how it played out. My family had been attending FFC for about a year and a half. Our neighbor was one of the original deacons at First Family. His wife and him were moving to Ohio to begin a medical residency. They were leaving. He was stepping down from being a deacon. So his wife needed a ride to the airport. I offered to help her. Uh, as we were driving down there, she mentioned to me that she thought I, would, I should look at pursuing a role as a deacon. She thought it might be something that I'd be really good at. So I said, honestly, I'd never thought of it. But I said, I'd pray about it. So as I was praying, you know, I couldn't escape that thought. I mean, you know, I, I, am I going to be good at this? Should I pursue it? Well, the passion started to build up in me. I began the journey by inspecting the people that were serving as deacons. They were all the original deacons at First Family at the time. So I, I really looked at what they were doing. Um, I got to know them. I asked questions of them. I started to serve alongside them see what it was all about, right, and see how they operated. After that, I decided to pursue the position. Since then, I've had the opportunity to help many people with physical needs, like moving, uh, home repair, other small jobs. Um, I've worked with people to develop a budget, to help pay their bills when they have fallen on hard times. And I'll tell you what, every one of our deacons would say the same thing. Every one of us have done the same type of jobs. We've also done things that many people think would be uh, the role of the elder. You know, we've counseled people through hardships in their life. 
uh, marital problems, family issues, health concerns. You know, the list can go on and on. You'd be surprised as we're sitting in with a family and a couple and we're talking about a benevolence need that they have, how that really is tied to some other deeper problem within their relationship. And we don't have the opportunity right then to say, well, let's press pause. I got to call an elder, right? We're spiritually able to handle that. And that's what a deacon's called to do. So we handle it on the, on the spot. I'll tell you, being a deacon is truly a rewarding position to fill in this church. So, I'm going to be closing here. I just got a question for you guys, for you guys to ponder. So, we've talked about elders, we've talked about deacons. Where do you guys fit in? Where does the campus collective student fit into this role of church leadership, right? I want you guys to know this right off the bat. The standard of God is the same for everyone. It is just that the leaders must be there so that everybody else knows that what the standard is to which they are to rise. So I don't want to paint a picture of the elders doing all the praying and the deacons doing all of the work, right? The elders and deacons are not the two teams playing in the Super Bowl this week while everybody sits there and watches, okay? There's no audience in the church. There should not be any spectators. We're all in ministry. I want to be clear of that. God made us all to serve. You guys should be looking for ways to serve. I'm not saying you should be running to try to join church leadership. You should be looking for ways to serve. You should be looking for ways to serve in Campus Collective. There's different opportunities here for you to serve. You should be looking not just in Campus Collective, though. There's a First Family Church here, right, that operates. We've got things going on all the time. You're going to walk out of here tonight. You're going to see that they're setting up for a daddy-daughter dance. Another opportunity to serve, right? You need to be looking in the four walls of, of First Family Church and then outside of those walls. How can you serve others today or tomorrow or every day? Those are questions that you guys need to ponder and ask yourself. I'm going to ask the band to come up here as we get ready to pray. But we're going to pray just a little differently tonight. I'm not going to just stand up here and pray for you guys. Um, I want you guys to break into some groups here, um, and you guys can choose your groups. Uh, just make it a group of two or three, and I want you to pray specifically for our elders and deacons, and I'm going to tell you their names, so just latch on to one or two of them and uh, pray for them, okay? And here's the things I want you to pray for. So these guys, all of us, have decisions we have to make on a daily, weekly basis that affect this church, right? So pray for wisdom to make those decisions. Pray for courage to make tough decisions. Pray for a home life balance, okay? So they can't just be all in at the church and forget about their home. We saw that in the qualifications. They got to manage their household well. Help them find that balance as they do it. So pray for them on that. Pray for them to have just health. Pray for them to be healthy so that they can serve our church well and then finally, pray for each of them by name that they will not be susceptible to the devil's attacks. We know they're coming. We know they come at us all the time. Pray that our elders and our deacons will not fall prey to that attack. Okay? So, uh, the elders' names. Obviously, uh, we've got Todd Stiles, Travis Walker, some of the other ones that don't preach on Sundays, but that will be preaching this uh, in this series in Galatians we're in, in the Fruit of the Spirit. Uh, this week we had Scott Helms preaching. Uh, he's another elder. We've got Mike Hartwig this coming Sunday that's going to be preaching. And then after that, we've got Gary Hydorn. Uh, we have uh, Dale Height, uh, Scott Searzan, and Brett Stiles are our two new ones. So those are our eight elders right now. So just pick one or two of those guys, pray for them by name, okay? And then the deacons, uh, and some of you might know these guys, but usually the deacons operate kind of in the shadows, in the background, so you probably don't know these guys really well. But their names are John Schmidt, Ben Roby, uh, and Ben was actually one of the original deacons here, uh, so he's, he's getting into his 20th year of serving as a deacon. Uh, Brant Carr is another one, Josh Miltenberger, and then myself. And yes, I would love it if you guys would pray for me as well as praying for those other guys uh, because the same things, you know, I need, I need prayer for the same things as the other guys do. So if you guys will get into groups real quick 
And uh, we'll just take like maybe uh, two to three minutes to pray. I'll close us after that, and then we'll turn it over to Levi, okay?